Uh, I think we've got um, a really interesting look at comprehensive um, care of patients with ADPKD. Um, so to, uh, to introduce this session further, I'd like to call upon my colleague, Dr. Mike Bevilacqua, um, who will take it from here. Great, fantastic, and thanks everyone for coming today. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce this talk for a few reasons. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, as many of you know, um, but it fits very nicely within our theme of, of what matters most. And along those lines, I do want to pause that this session this morning was made possible by a very generous donation from the Sandu family. Specifically, it's been made in, in honor of uh, RK and AK Sandu. And they're a family that actually have been living with polycystic disease for quite some time, have been infected by it, and most of its forms that it can uh, come in. So I, I do want to thank them for the generous gift. That One of their specific desires was to see some world-renowned expert come to BC to help us all learn and improve our approach to polycystic disease. And so along those lines, I'm very, very uh, happy and we think we're all privileged to hear from Dr. Fawaz Shabib from the Mayo Clinic. So Dr. Shabib is a nephrologist and assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic. His research focus is advancing the care of, of patients with uh, polycystic kidney disease. And it leads really the, the, it runs the whole gamut from molecular mechanisms right up to translation into the bedside. In fact, his, some of his publications, including his work on how we build a comprehensive approach, has been kind of the cornerstone of what we're trying to do here in, in British Columbia as we uh, build our PKD network. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Shabib, and I look very much uh, to forward to hearing what he has to say. Hi everyone, thank you so much Dr. Bevilacqua for the kind introduction. And I share my gratitude to the Sandu family. You know, with PKD it's a family affair and we're kind of all involved and we like to change the outcomes for the patients and also their families and for the generations to come. So I'm very grateful for uh, all the PKD patients. Uh, so for the next 40 to 45 minutes, I'd like to focus on my approach to autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Um, it's a topic that's very dear to my heart as well. And uh, so I have no disclosures related to this topic uh, or this lecture. Today, um, I'll focus on some updates and diagnosis and prognosis of uh, polycystic kidney disease and also the advances in management uh, of uh, PKD patients, particularly ADPKD patients, how we uh, approach it comprehensively and in a multidisciplinary fashion, and also the role of the newly FDA and the, the newly approved drug uh, tolvaptan. So let me start by uh, showing two patients that have autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. They're both uh, young males, and as you can see, they have almost normal GFR. Uh, but uh, also when you, when you look at their abdominal images, uh, they're definitely, they don't have normal kidneys despite this normal GFR. Um, so in 2019, how can we differentiate a patient with this GFR, a normal kidney, versus a patient with mild cystic burden and somebody like patient A who has severe uh, cystic bur burden? And is there a way we can estimate their uh, onset of end-stage kidney disease. So the main question is, when am I gonna be on dialysis? When do I need to prepare for transplant? So it's a very important information, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be able to um, uh, uh, do that in your, in your clinic and with your patients. So patient A, uh, it's estimated that he would reach end-stage uh, at age 40 versus the uh, patient B at age 70. So it's a big difference. And uh, these days we have a disease-modifying drug that can slow down the disease progression in addition to other management that I will be going uh, through that in the talk. So for centuries, uh, physicians and scientists have been fascinated by polycystic kidney disease. And uh, Dr. Rayet, a French uh, physician uh, back in the 1800s, uh, had kind of a gloomy picture of, of cystic kidney disease. And he mentioned, once you see cysts in the kidney, uh, or you suspect it, it's an illness without cure. Uh, so uh, to this date, that we don't have a cure, but it's, uh, we have a lot of hope and it's not as gloomy as a picture uh, in the 1800s. So what is ADPKD? ADPKD uh, is the most common inherited kidney disease. In fact, someone can argue it's the most common inherited disease uh, in general. It affects about uh, one to 500 to one to 1,000 uh, people and about 12 to 13 million people worldwide. 
So although it's considered as a kind of a rare disease, but it really affects a lot of people, and uh, patients and families with PKD, they don't feel it's rare because they say, all my family or most of my family and my cousins have PKD, so please don't tell me it's a rare disease. So uh, uh, it's a very sensitive topic for them. And then more than 50% of these patients would reach end-stage kidney disease in their uh, fifth decade. But as I will show, it's highly variable uh, and it's heterogeneous, so it's important to know that not all PKD patients uh, have the same clinical course. Uh, to go through, I like always to start with some milestones in PKD because we have achieved a lot of uh, uh, knowledge about PKD and that led to, uh, to, to changes in the outcome and the treatment. So uh, in, the, in the 1800s, um, you know, the uh, term polycystic kidney disease was coined. And then it wasn't until the 1980s with Dr. Grantham from the University of Kansas kind of understood more uh, the pathophysiology of why these cysts uh, start to form. And uh, a very important milestone was that cyclic AMP leads to the fluid secretion in these cysts. And then in the mid-1990s, uh, the PKD1 and PKD2 genes were uh, discovered. And then later on, we understood more the clinical course and the natural history of polycystic kidney disease and understanding that total kidney volume or how big the kidneys are on the imaging is an important biomarker to understand the severity of the disease. And that also led to the Mayo imaging classification, which I will explain in, in a few slides. And also the understanding of if you block uh, the uh, vasopressin V2 receptor uh, on the kidney, you can block the cyclic AMP uh, formation and thus slowing down the, the disease in PKD animals, which led to the first successful trial of TEMPO34 using tolvaptan as the V2 receptor antagonist, and then to the approval in Japan, Canada, Europe, and uh, finally in the United States as uh, uh, in May 2018. And then there were other clinical trials that uh, uh, were performed, uh, but they were not as successful. Uh, some of them are the mTOR inhibitors, uh, octreotide, and lanreotide, but unfortunately they were not uh, as successful as we wished. And there is currently other clinical trials that are being performed, uh, another VAPTAN, and there's other uh, disease-modifying drugs through other mechanisms such as venclostat, bardoxolone, and also in Australia, there's an interesting trial using a water prescription, and I will emphasize that in my talk as well. So polycystic kidney disease, or ADPKD, is due to mostly two main genes, PKD1 and PKD2. PKD1 is uh, the more severe disease. It's the most common, up to 85% of the cases, and patients on average reach end stage in their mid-50s versus PKD2 in their mid-70s, um, and they encode PC1 and PC2. Those two proteins uh, form the polycystin complex uh, that resides mostly on the cilia, um, and it has an effect on the calcium and cyclic AMP signaling, which I will explain in a minute as well. It's important to note that polycystic kidney disease is a systemic disease. So the first signs usually is polyuria nocturia, so the patients cannot concentrate their urine, but also they might have hypertension early on despite the normal kidney function and not so much of a big kidney of big kidneys, uh, and many of the patients would first notice or they get diagnosed when they have gross hematuria, flank pain, they go to the ER and they get diagnosed. And there's a lot of extra renal manifestations. Uh, the most important uh, ones are the liver cysts or uh, polycystic liver disease, which affects almost all the patients. They might have few liver cysts, uh, but mostly uh, the severe PLD would be in females and many of them would require either a liver resection or liver transplantation. And intracranial aneurysm is uh, in higher frequency in, um, in PKD patients much more than the general population, and particularly if they have a family history of intracranial aneurysm or sudden death, their risk is about 25%, um, and they, they would require uh, a brain MRA uh, at least every five years uh, to screen for that. So let me start with a case, and this would require uh, polling uh, if you want to pull your apps. So uh, it's about a 43-year-old uh, male patient who has polycystic kidney disease, and he's coming with CKD stage 5, is getting prepared for transplant, and he, three of his children come, come with him. Uh, his older son 
uh, is 41, and he, has, uh, he had renal ultrasound, and it didn't show any kidney cysts. Uh, his daughter is 36. She had a CT scan, and she had more than 15 cysts on each kidney. His son has uh, had an abdominal MRI, and he had only one renal cyst at age 29. So my question is, do any, or the patient's question was, do any of my kids have ADPKD and do they need any additional testing? So option A uh, is only the daughter has PKD and no need for further testing or genetic testing. Uh, B is cannot exclude ADPKD in younger son. C, need an abdominal CT scan for older son. And we give it a, a few seconds, okay, let's see. Hopefully the app works. Okay. okay, all right, so interesting, so great. Um, okay, so uh, most of uh, the audience think it's B, that we cannot exclude ADPKD in younger son. Um, so actually the answer is A, and I'll, I'll show you why, uh, which, is, which is good, there's, there, there's a, uh, there's a, a learning opportunity. So <laughs> it, it's, it is, it's a tricky question to, to keep you engaged. So how, to, how do we diagnose post kidney disease? Uh, so when we need to diagnose post kidney disease, it's important to know if there's a typical family history of ADPKD. Uh, be aware that there's other uh, autosomal dominant kidney disease that can mimic uh, PKD, and we're, we're understanding more the genetics of that. But 99% of the chances, if you have a typical family history of ADPKD, and if it's positive, there's very defined criteria for ultrasound uh, diagnosis. So if you have a positive family history, depending on the age, there's a certain number of cysts. So 15 to 39, if you have three or more, and then if you're 40 and above, you need two kidney cysts in each, uh, two cysts in each kidney. Uh, versus if you don't have a family history, there's no defined criteria yet. Uh, we go by the general uh, kind of the clinical presentation and we think that bilateral renal enlargement with more than 10 cysts in each kidney uh, would be uh, likely ADPKD. You cannot confirm. Sorry if I come back. And then, so how do we exclude ADPKD? And that's an important question, especially if somebody wants to donate for their family members. Uh, so if somebody is by age 40, they don't have kidney cysts, uh, you're, you can exclude ADPKD, and if somebody is younger and willing to donate, having a CT scan or MRI and having less than five cysts, so four or less, would exclude ADPKD if you have a typical family history. And this is based on uh, some general population data uh, in our center. So again, those are the imaging diagnostic criteria, and then if, let's say somebody has already a CT scan for any reason, you're not gonna go back and do an ultrasound, so the criteria actually is, if you have positive family history and you have a, a, a CT scan or MRI, having a total of 10 cysts, more than 10 cysts, would be diagnostic for ADPKD. Okay, uh, so for that reason, the, other, the younger son has only one, one cyst, he's 29, we can exclude ADPKD, and the daughter who had more than 15 cysts on each kidney uh, would have ADPKD. Uh, so wh when do we use which modality? So ultrasound is great uh, because it's cost effective. We can do it any time, no radiation. But the only time I use it is for mostly for screening. And after that, I would, I would require either a CT scan or MRI because that detects smaller cysts. And we can really have the total kidney volume, uh, which will, be, which will uh, enable us to prognosticate and follow up on these patients. Uh, the difference between CT scan and MRI is uh, sometimes ac uh, access, so it's hard to get MRIs sometimes, but I, would, I usually like MRIs first because there's no radiation, no contrast needed, and you can distinguish a cyst versus a renal parenchyma without the contrast on T2 weighted, uh, weighted images. Versus the CT scan, there's radiation involved and you need uh, the IV contrast to distinguish the cyst versus the renal parenchyma. So, uh, Right now, since there's uh, new treatments in the horizon and a treatment that's approved, we changed our recommendations for screening and we uh, offer the screening for all adult patients who are at risk of ADPKD, i.e. having a positive family history. Uh, but we first discussed the implications on life insurance. We tried to get them the life insurance first before getting screened. Uh, 
uh, and also we discussed the changes on the employment, psychosocial aspects, and we engage with our social workers uh, in these situations. Uh, we start with an ultrasound. If it's negative and it's ruled out, then we don't need to proceed any further. If somebody is young and willing to donate, we usually go for a CT and MRI. Um, so family history is, is good, is important, but it's not the whole picture. Uh, so if somebody has a one relative that had end stage less than 50, you're almost sure that they have PKD1 versus a relative that reached end stage after 70, most likely they have PKD2. Uh, in, in 10 to 15 percent of the cases, the family history is negative. Uh, there's 5 percent of the cases, it's de novo mutations, and sometimes there's milder disease that doesn't get diagnosed. Uh, or there's unavailability of records, and also there's mosaism, which means that not all the cells in your body have been affected by the mutation, and sometimes that lead to uh, milder disease. So when, we, when we're looking at ADPKD, we always have in mind the differential diagnosis. So if somebody has smaller kidneys, advanced CKD, and some cysts, then they might have acquired renal cystic disease. If they have more of a liver phenotype rather than the kidney cyst phenotype, they could have ADPLD, uh, autosomal dominant polycystic liver disease, and there's the recessive form which involves more uh, uh, children, and it's associated with congenital hepatic fibrosis, and other uh, syndromes such as tuberous sclerosis, von Hippel-Lindau, and other rare diseases like X-linked dominant uh, uh, oral facial digital abnormalities. And also I entertain a lot of times ADTKD, so autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease, or the new term for medullary cystic uh, diseases. So those are, are diseases that cause interstitial fibrosis. They can cause some kidney cysts. They're due to different genes such as MAC1, uromodulin, HNF1 beta. And a lot of these patients would have uh, gout, high uric acid at early age, family history of uric, uh, high uric acid, smaller kidneys, and then uh, lower GFR than expected for the cystic burden. So that's always something that whenever I see it, I always suspect that, and we run the genetic testing for it. Okay, so I think of renal cystic disease as a spectrum, genetic spectrum. So in ADPKD, the main, uh, the main symptom or the main presentation is the kidney cyst due to PKD1, PKD2. There's the recessive form uh, due to PKHD1 uh, mutations. But also liver cysts are involved in ADPKD uh, as well. But there's the entity that causes mostly liver cysts, which is ADPLD, and due to these uh, different mutations. And uh, uh, recently we described a new mutation or a new gene called GANAB. And it's kind of in between. It can cause renal cysts, it can cause liver cysts, uh, but not as much as PKD1, PKD2. And it, it accounts for almost 0.3% of ADPKD patients. And then there's the ADTKD that I mentioned uh, that has more interstitial fibrosis but can have kidney cysts. And we also described a new gene called DNAJB11, which is kind of in between ADTKD and ADPKD, meaning it causes more renal cysts than expected with ADTKD, but has more uh, fibrosis and lower GFR uh, than expected uh, compared to ADPKD. So, uh, another, so we're continuing with the case. It's the same family. And I would like you to uh, consider po uh, uh, putting your, your answer. So we diagnosed now the daughter, 36-year-old, with ADPKD. Her current creatinine is 1.2. She had gross hematuria in the past. She's hypertensive. Uh, her urine is quite concentrated. And she has a little bit of uh, albuminuria. So she would like to know when, does she need, when she's going to reach end-stage kidney disease. So her father currently is 43 and CKD5, so almost getting there. So do you think she's gonna have the same clinical course? Uh, would you tell her we don't have the magic ball, we can't predict? Or would you ask her to, uh, or would you tell her we need to do some more measurements, uh, particularly TKV? So we're doing much better this time. <laughs> All right, uh, great. So yes, so uh, the main take home message here is that not all PKD patients within the same family would have the same clinical course. Some would have milder disease, some would have more severe disease. So it's not appropriate to tell her 
that you know, you're, let's see where, when your father or grandfather reached end stage and you'll probably be the same. It is possible that it's similar, but it, it was also possible that it's not. Um, so C is the correct answer. So TKV is very, very important uh, in order to be able to prognosticate. And I'll show you uh, her, uh, her case, actually. So this is based off the, we, we learned the natural history of uh, how PKD progresses and evolves based on the CRISP study, the Consortium for Radiological Imaging Studies, uh, which, was, which involved four uh, uh, big centers in the United States, including Mayo Clinic. And in, in this study, we learned that although the patients had very large kidney volumes, they initially started with normal GFR. And then we learned that with time, the total kidney volume increases significantly. Uh, there's a kind of a range. Uh, on average, it's 5% per year, but some have lower, some have much higher. And then you lose GFR, uh, on average, 5 ml per minute per year, but some have lower, some have higher. And then the higher the total kidney volume, and the younger, so the younger you are and the bigger the kidneys you, are, you have, uh, then the more severe the disease is. And this is, was the milestone or the stepping stone uh, to approve total kidney volume as a diagnostic, uh, diagnost, uh, prognostic biomarker, excuse me, uh, because GFR, despite having those huge kidneys, is not a good biomarker. And that was important for uh, the, the clinical trials, and that also led the way or paved the way for other clinical trials to, to come forward. So again, so despite having big kidneys, your GFR is uh, almost normal up to the point where you cannot adapt, the, cyst, the kidney cannot adapt anymore and the cysts are uh, damaging the kidney and then you start seeing more of a decline of the GFR. So in the early phase in younger patients, we like to look at TKV and then in, all, in uh, advanced stages, we like to look at both. Um, and then, uh, so at, at Mayo with Dr. Torres and Dr. Irazabel, they uh, classified patients in two categories, typical and atypical. The majority are typical, which means that you have bilateral kidney cysts and uh, all the cysts are contributing equally to the volume of the kidneys. And it could be uh, mild, class 1A, to severe, class 1E. And they divided the patient into these uh, five classes. And these classes, would predict how much they're growing in terms of total kidney volume per year, but also it, it, uh, it reflects or it predicts the GFR decline. So the class 1A, they probably won't reach end stage. Class 1B, probably they would reach end stage in their 70s. Class 1C, D, and E, they would reach end stage uh, anywhere between their late 30s, 40s to, oops, excuse me, 60s. Um, so we defined, so it was hard to define what is rapidly progressive disease, uh, but based on, on the Mayo classification and the expected GFR decline, we defined class 1C through 1E as uh, patients at risk of rapidly progressive disease. Uh, and then the atypical uh, patients are the ones that have focal disease, so it's asymmetric uh, or focal, and these patients have much, higher, much better prognosis because they have an almost preserved kidney uh, uh, on the other side. So these patients probably don't reach end stage uh, from, from the cystic burden. But also there's the class 2B, which have parenchymal atrophy. Uh, they have cysts and their, their kidneys are smaller. Probably they have vascular disease. And these patients do much worse uh, uh, than the general ADPKD uh, uh, clinical course. So total kidney volume has been appro uh, approved by the FDA. In fact, it's the first radiological biomarker to be approved by the FDA. Um, and then we can get total kidney volume by planimetry, which is the gold standard. And that involves an imaging analyst, an imaging software in about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, the older uh, way of doing it was stereology, putting a grid and then coloring the kidney. But also there's a way that you can do in your, in your uh, practice. Uh, if you have any software where you're looking at the kidneys and you can measure the sizes, the different sizes of the kidney, you can estimate uh, the kidney volume by the ellipsoid equation. And I'll give you this, uh, this example actually of this 36-year-old uh, uh, patient that we were talking about. So if you go to Google and you uh, type ADPKD classification, you will see a Mayo Clinic research link. You'll go there and there's ways you can uh, enter these, uh, these numbers. So if you measure the maximal sagittal length, the coronal, the maximum width and depth of both kidneys, you can plug them in, and then you can calculate the right kidney volume, left kidney volume, 
and then based on their age and their height, uh, you can classify them into, into which category. And for this particular patient, she was class 1D. And a nice feature of, of this is you can predict future GFR. And I think that's the most important question for the patients, and that's what matters most, right, for the patients is they want to plan their, uh, their years ahead. And I have patients, actually, they might move from a state to another if they know where they're going to, when they're going to have uh, their transplant because they, they look at the wait list, at which, which centers. They, you know, they, they change their life according to these information, this information. So this particular patient, would, it's predicted that she would reach end stage uh, uh, in 12 years at age 48, which is a little bit better than her father at age 43. Uh, well, it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it at least gives you a, a kind of a close, uh, uh, an idea of uh, when they're, they're going to lose GFR. Another big important message is that uh, autosomal dominant post skin disease is a very high, high, highly variable disease. So in, uh, in these examples, they're mostly PKD1 patients. And um, you can see that it's, it's very variable from very severe to very mild. And most of these patients are in their mid-age, 30s to 40s. Um, so even if you have PKD1 mutation, you can still have milder disease than others. And genetics is important to, to know and understand, but there's other factors, epigenetics, environmental, how they, they were eating, drinking, and all these things. Uh, it's important on how, on how the disease will progress. This is another way of looking at how variable the disease is. So this is data from our center. We looked at about 300 patients who reached end-stage kidney disease and had kidney volume. And as you can see uh, on the left side, um, Nobody was injured. Um, on the left side, so we're, we're seeing that patients can reach, we have patients that reach end stage in their 30s, but also we had patients that reached end stage in their 70s, 80s. So it's a very wide range. And also we see that height adjusted kidney volume is pretty high, uh, so they have big kidneys when they reach end stage in their uh, up till age 55, uh, based on our analysis, and after that, we see that also the kidney volumes are big, but not as big as younger patients. And we think that there's other factors involved with, uh, with aging, vascular remodeling, and so forth that, that leads also to the end-stage kidney disease. And also on the right side, uh, I'm showing different pedigrees that have the same exact mutation. So those are different families. So for example, uh, pedigree one shows a family that has PKD1 truncating mutation and they reach end state, one family member reach end stage at 38 versus another family member at 68. So there's a big difference uh, within even the same mutation. So there's a lot of other factors that are involved and that's why we like the TKV, the imaging classification, because that individualizes the treatment and the prognosis for the patient. So whatever they inherited or they've been doing, we know exactly what's gonna happen to, the, to their clinical course. All right, one last uh, polling. So, so now that she understands that she's at, uh, she has rapid progressive disease, uh, she would like to know what are her options to slow her disease progression. Uh, so option A, water prescription, B, a PKD diet, uh, C, tolvaptan, Genarc in, uh, in Canada or Genarc-Q in, in, in the States, tight blood pressure control, E, all of the above. All of the above. Almost perfect score. All right, so uh, correct. So all of the above. So uh, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, if we can go back to the slides, perfect. There's a lot of things that we can do for the patients, uh, all all ADPKD patients, uh, and I'll show you what what I do in clinic. Sorry about that. Okay, so PKD. The way I was, I, was, I think about it is kind of a benign tubular neoplasm. In fact, I'm fascinated that only about 5% of the nephrons can lead to this devastating disease. And we can see, sometimes we can see cysts in utero, so it starts early on. Uh, it's due to the defect of polycystins. So polycystins are supposed to 
uh, sense the pressure of the urine flow uh, and the tubules, and that leads to calcium entry and regulation of cyclic AMP. But with PKD1 or PKD2 mutation, you have defect in these polycystin proteins, which leads to lower calcium intracellularly, and which leads to higher cyclic AMP, because you, dis dis uh, you have less destruction and more formation of cyclic AMP. Uh, in fact, vasopressin, AVP, or ADH, stimulates V2 receptor and stimulates the formation of cyclic AMP here, which leads to the activation of a lot of pathways downstream leading to cell proliferation, fluid secretion, and the formation of cysts. So if you block uh, cyclic AMP formation, uh, then you'll have less PKA and less of these uh, deleterious effects. And that's how the rationale for V2 receptors came along. So Dr. Torres at Mayo with Dr. Vince Catone, uh, you know, used this understanding of, of, of the disease and they tried a VAPTAN on the uh, PKD mice and rats. And in fact, one of those VAPTANs uh, was able, they were able to show that when you give it to these uh, PKD animals, you slow down and you inhibit the cyst formation. And they also did a very nice uh, experiment where they uh, removed vasopressin completely from uh, one of the PKD uh, rat animals they removed completely vasopressin. So these, these uh, rats actually drink about 12 liters a day. So they have no way of uh, concentrating their urine. And in fact, if you have no vasopressin at all, you cannot make uh, cysts. So if, if you have no vasopressin, there would, no, there would be no ADPKD. But we cannot live without vasopressin, otherwise we cannot, be, uh, we cannot concentrate our urine. Um, so this, wa this was a good rationale and good, uh, good proof of concept. And in fact, in this experiment, they gave back vasopressin and they rescued uh, the phenotype, the cystic phenotype. So this led to the, for, to, uh, the structuring of TEMPO trials, uh, looking at the efficacy and safety and outcomes of tolvaptan, a V2 receptor antagonist. TEMPO 3.4 was the biggest trial uh, for ADPKD patients, uh, was multinational, about 1,400 patients, randomized controlled trial, double-blinded. And then the extension was TEMPO 4.4, and Reprise was also kind of an extension for more advanced uh, CKD uh, as required by the FDA. So in TEMPO 3.4, uh, tolvaptan uh, uh, slowed down the increase in total kidney volume. So the kidneys are not growing on average at 5.5% per year. They're growing at 2.8% per year, so about 50%. So it's kind of putting the brake on the growth of these kidneys. But what's important, or what matters, is uh, we want to slow down the GFR decline, and that was shown to be uh, statistically significant, with about 1.3 uh, ml per minute per year improvement uh, of GFR. Um, so it's a medication that's not a cure. It's important to, uh, to have that expectation with the patients, but at least it slows down the disease progression and its cumulative effect. Uh, so the more you're on it, and the, the younger you're on it, the more benefit you're gonna, you're gonna have. And I'll show some uh, uh, extrapolation on that. But surprisingly, there was uh, drug-induced hepatotoxicity uh, from tolvaptan. About 5% of the patients had increased in liver function tests, um, and about two, uh, two in a thousand, so three out of the whole population of, of TEMPO 3.4, reached a very high uh, level of LFTs, which was kind of dangerous, uh, which was called highs, reaching the highs low, uh, putting those patients at 10% risk of liver failure. None of these patients had liver failure because once it was stopped, it was reversed. Uh, but this was concerning for the FDA, and they requ uh, required a more, uh, more data on the hepatotoxicity. They also required more data on the more advanced CKD, and that was the rationale for the reprise trial uh, recruiting more uh, CKD patients down to GFR of 25, and also it showed uh, that tolvaptan is, uh, is, uh, slows down the GFR decline even in advanced CKD, uh, and it showed that if you do monthly blood work for LFTs, uh, you, you kind of mitigate that hepatotoxicity uh, or the severe hepatotoxicity uh, effect. So based on all these trials, uh, it was approved first in Japan, then Canada, Europe, uh, and different other countries, and finally in the United States, and the uh, labeled indication was adults at risk of rapidly progressive kidney disease. 
but unfortunately the FDA didn't define it, so we had to step up and kind of meet together and define, uh, define this, this indication. So this was uh, the, the paper from uh, Jason in 2018, the practical guide of treating uh, PKD patients with tolvaptan. So what we do is first you need to confirm the diagnosis of PKD because now you're, you're gonna put them on a lifelong medication that has a lot of uh, implications. Uh, you have to confirm that they have typical ADPKD, measure their total kidney volume, classify them into one CD or E, and then decide based on their GFR and age if they would benefit from tolvaptan. And the milder disease, uh, uh, Mayo class 1A or B, we would check again a TKV in two to three years or more reassure them for the Mayo class 1A, which is, when I, whenever I have Mayo class 1A, I'm very happy in clinic because I give them a very good prognosis. Uh, and usually they're very concerned about their diagnosis, but now that they know, you know, they're gonna probably outlive their kidneys, they wouldn't be as worried. They should still um, have a good control of their blood pressure, of course, and uh, continue to be healthy. So I, uh, what we call the basic optimized ADPKD management, we like to, uh, to have this management for all the patients, including the atypical patients. And this uh, involves an intensive blood pressure control. So for the patients who are at risk of rapidly progressive disease, we have more intense uh, blood pressure goal, less than 110 over 75, and we like to start with an ACE or ARB. Then if they need more medications, a beta blocker such as carvedilol, uh, then if they're not gonna be on tolvaptan, we consider diuretic, then a calcium channel blocker. Uh, we also, uh, for the other patients who have milder disease, we still uh, recommend less than 130 over 80. And then we recommend uh, a moderate restriction of sodium for two reasons. One, for the hypertension, but also for the smaller intake, and I will talk about that in a second, which means the less sodium you drink, the easier you're going to be able to suppress your vasopressin and help with the uh, cyst progression. So that's part of the water prescription that I do. Uh, and the hydration is very important. The reason is you wanna suppress your natural ADH, vasopressin. Um, and usually I, I give them a water prescription and I'll give you an example in a minute. So this is the water prescription I do. So uh, any osmolar intake, so osmols are salt and protein mostly. So any osmol you take, you're gonna uh, get rid of them through the urine. And the more osmols you take, the more uh, urine you have to make. Um, so that, you know, um, so in a sense that if you wanna suppress your vasopressin, you wanna have a dilute urine, right? And uh, a good way of measuring uh, vasopressin uh, in our system is looking at the urine osmolality. And if you have it less than 280, so less than your serum osmol, so you have a hypotonic urine, then you know that you're su suppressing your vasopressin. And in order to do that, you wanna drink a lot of water, but also you wanna eat less of those osmols uh, because that's gonna affect how much water you need to suppress your vasopressin. So the way how I do it is I, ch I check a volume of 24 hours, I check a urine osm, and this will give me the osmolar intake per day, and I try to reach the 280 milliosm uh, per kilogram. So if they're eating 1,000 milliosm per day, they need 3.5 liters of fluid throughout the day. If they're eating less milliosm, so less salt, less protein, they will need less uh, volume, less, uh, less water to suppress this vasopressin, and they would need 2.1 liters. So this kind of a little bit of a, the concept, uh, and this is the basis of the trial uh, in Australia. Another thing that I would, I also emphasize with patients is trying to maintain a normal BMI. There are some studies in our lab that showed if you restrict calories 10, 20, even 40%, uh, you, uh, you decrease the cyst uh, progression in, in the animals. We're, we're trying to do a clinical trial. It's hard to uh, fund that. Uh, but it's, it's a harmful, harmless, excuse me, uh, recommendation. So if you, uh, if you ask the patients to maintain their BMI, to cut down 10 to 20% their calories, there's probably a good benefit in slowing down the disease progression. And we have a low threshold to start a statin based on a, stu a smaller study in ADPKD patients and children uh, based in Colorado. So we kind of discussed this. Uh, this is kind of the flow that we go through in our clinic when we are trying to start uh, tolvaptan. First, confirming ADPKD, then the rapid progression, 
Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, logistics after, after that. So once we identify the patients who would benefit from tolvaptan, uh, we have a good discussion with the patients about the benefits, the risks, what it entails in terms of the aquaresis effect. So the most two important things are hepatotoxicity, so they, we'll talk about that and how we can mitigate it, but also the aquaresis effect. So uh, they're gonna drink probably five to six liters a day and they're gonna have a lot of bathroom trips. And sometimes this is challenging for, for patients. Uh, most of them they tolerated. We, we didn't have a lot of dropouts um, uh, and we kind of give them instructions on how to mitigate the aquaresis by lowering their salt, protein, the timing of, of the day on when they can take it and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and then there's the initiation, the titration and the optimization of the tol tolvaptan treatment um, and then the liver, toxic, the, the liver test. So this is, this is the protocol that, that we use and we published. So once we enroll them in the REMS program, which is an FDA mandated program that requires monthly blood tests for the first 18 months, um, then we start uh, at 45 milligrams in the morning and 15 milligrams in the afternoon. Uh, and then we titrate up uh, to 90 milligrams in the morning and 30 milligrams if, uh, in the afternoon if they tolerate it. Sometimes we don't have to titrate up if they reach a hypotonic urine. So if they reach a urine osmolality of less than 280, we don't have to go to 60-30 or 90-30. Uh, and then we enroll them in the monthly programs. They can do that uh, locally, so they don't have to come back to visit us, um, especially in the winter time in Rochester. We have a lot of snow. Uh, so uh, the first 18 months, it's every month. And then after that, it's every three months. Uh, the FDA requires liver function tests, but we also included other safety labs, including sodium and creatinine. It's important to know that you might expect a little bit of a drop in GFR, similar to when you start uh, an ACE inhibitor. In the studies, it was about six to 8% on average, the drop in GFR. Um, in our protocol, we uh, tolerated up to 20% uh, drop in GFR before we change the dose or hold uh, tolvaptan. And this number is based on what, what the cr actual practice for, for ACE inhibitors as well. And then if they have hyponatremia, we adjust the dose. We, we tell them to reduce their hydration. If they have hypernatremia, then we ask them to drink more. Sometimes we need to adjust the dose as well. And then if they have any derangements in LFTs, uh, we have also a protocol. Uh, and based on this protocol, we had also our nursing protocol. So in our clinic, we have uh, three PKD nurses, uh, champion nurses, that once I identify these patients, I start them on the medication, they follow up on these monthly labs because there's a lot of follow-ups and we don't wanna miss uh, or delay any review of these labs. So they've been very helpful, uh, extremely helpful with the process. So if they have any LFT derangements, we ask them to hold tolvaptan, they get the history. Uh, then we try to identify if there's any other reasons such as viruses, uh, Tylenol, most of the times it's alcohol, so if they've been on a, out on a party, in a party, and then the, they do the LFTs, it's usually up. And uh, when this occurs, usually it comes down right away. Uh, the LFTs come down normalized right away after you hold tolvaptan and you hold alcohol or Tylenol. Uh, but then if it was due to tolvaptan, it usually lingers. Uh, the LFTs kind of stay up for, for a while. Uh, sometimes we re-challenge them depending on, on how high the LFTs were. When we re-challenge them, we recheck the LFTs much more frequently and we're kind of on top of it. Uh, so it's a process when this happens. Uh, one last thing is I mentioned that the earlier you start, the better. So this is an important uh, take home message because many times I hear from different nephrologists that you know their GFR is normal, I'll wait until their CKD stage three and then I'll bring them back and I'll start. Uh, so this is kind of the wrong approach with ADPKD, uh, humbly, uh, because you want to start, you want to uh, modify the disease uh, early on, because the earlier you start, the more benefit you're going to get. So you want to put that break as early as you can. So here we did the projection based on Tempo 3-4 and Reprise. Uh, so if you start uh, a patient uh, at GFR of 90 ml per minute, you will gain about, on average, seven to eight years of postponing the dialysis time or the, uh, the transplant time. So to make it easier for patients, I usually tell them, if you're rapidly progressive, 
disease, and I'm going to prescribe 12 up 10. Every four years of treatment, uh, you're going to postpone the need for dialysis by one year. If things, you know, if you don't have cyst infections, bleeding, other complications, this is probably the, roughly the estimation. Um, so this is an important information for them, and I think even one year, two years of postponing dialysis time is, is very precious for patients. And, uh, you know, we have patients with us today, and, and you all s certainly uh, agree with that and appreciate that any time postponing dialysis is a, is, is a precious time. So going back to these two patients, so uh, for patient A, uh, the total kidney volume was 2000, about 2,000, patient B was about 652. So patient A has Mayo class 1E, predicted end stage at age 42, versus Mayo class 1B for patient B and predicted ESRD at age 70. So for patient A, I would start Tolvaptan. For patient B, I would monitor and then do the basic optimized management. And hopefully in the future, if we have uh, more treatment options that are as, as benign or as tolerated as ACE inhibitors or other different medications, uh, probably I would even start patient B on, so class 1B, I would give them something that's uh, more tolerable. So it's all about risks and benefits for these, uh, for these patients. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I'd like to thank our PKD, Mayo PKD Center. We're uh, very passionate about PKD. We are about 65 scientists, physicians, physician scientists. We have about 20 to 25 uh, clinical coordinators, support staff, and we're trying to engage with different dietitians, social workers, our nurses, to really have a comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach. In addition to liver surgeons, neurosurgeons, neurologists, hepatologists um, that are involved in, in the PKD care. And I uh, will take any questions. Thank you. Almost perfect timing. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shabib. That was a fantastic talk. Um, it's really exciting to see just how much has come, and your role in developing this and moving this forward and sharing that with us is, is very, very meaningful. Um, we'll take, in the interest of time, just maybe one or two questions, because we're the last thing standing between people and lunch. Um, so there's the <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> otherwise we'll be here afterwards. But Hi, a, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm you. a pharmacist in a CKD clinic, and I just have a question about Tolvaptin. So um, I'm wondering if there's a GFR cutoff where you wouldn't use it. So say you have Tolvaptin and someone, their GFR is declining below 25. Is yep. there a point where you would discontinue it? Yeah, so uh, ba thank you for the question. Based on the Reprise study, uh, it was shown to be effective up to a GFR of 25. But personally, I think when they're that low in GFR, there's, it's a lot of work for them to gain just a few months of, of postponing the dialysis. So usually I, I, I give them the option of starting it, but I usually, the, the patients between 25 to 30, I'm very more careful. Uh, I'm more careful in, in kind of how to approach, uh, and then I'll let the patient decide with me, but I usually try to use it 30 and above, uh, just because of how much it involves and all the blood work, and it, it's probably not worth it to start it that much, but there's evidence that it, it, it works. So for the patients that would like to be on it, uh, I will start it, yeah. Oh, okay, right, and this you. last question uh, over here. Yeah. Is there a way to do real-time osmolality checking for the patients so that they know day-to-day, -day, are they doing a good job? Yeah, um, it's a good question, actually. So some of the patients, uh, especially the stone patients, so different than ADPKD, we give them, we ask them to buy sometimes uh, the, the urine dipsticks, and they can do it at home just to make sure that you know, they're doing dilution, diluting their urine enough. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't done that, but that would be, uh, I think that's what they're doing as well in the uh, ADPKD prevent trial in, in Australia is to have the patients gauge on a day-to-day -day how much they're, they're diluting their urine. But that would be actually a very good uh, implica uh, application in the clinic. Yeah, thank you. Great, and thank you so much, Dr. Shabib.